Um, so, hi, yeah. Uh, this, um, this presentation is a sort of amalgam of my brain and how I think about building soundscapes and also a little bit like about the story of building soundscape which is a plug-in <laughs> that, uh, right? Hey. <laughs> Got him. Gotcha. So that's what the, per the parentheses is all about. <laughs> it's important to explain your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, this is a topic that I'm really interested in. I think, I think, uh, uh, Building uh, environments, uh, ambient sound uh, for sort of the worlds we're in, is a, is a huge part about building um, the actual world and making it feel like a, a real place. <clears throat> so, who am I? Uh, I am Dan Reynolds. I am the senior technical audio designer embedded with the audio engine development team at Epic Games didn't all fit on there. <laughs> I used that joke twice, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so my role on the team, generally speaking, is to work and consult with the audio engine, develop, uh, the audio engine dev team uh, on Unreal Audio Engine features and uh, to argue with them about them, those features, and try to win arguments as much as possible, um, and uh, generally, hopefully, be, act like a representative of the, our users. I hope to represent all of you uh, in and be an advocate for for your experience in working in Unreal Engine features. So, um, but as a subject matter expert, I'm often pulled into. Uh, demonstrating a lot of the sort of new fancy technology that we we develop and that um, usually I will sort of get pulled into GDC demos or things like the if you all saw the Matrix Awakens which is like a really cool GDC demo without GDC and um, so stuff like that and as uh, as a sound designer working in those very fast-paced environments, I find I've found myself um, having to build sort of foundational tools over and over, systems over and over again. And so, really, I um, this tool, the soundscape that I'm going to be talking about, was built for myself um, because I wanted to stop uh, re revisiting the foundations and start expanding and uh, um, uh, enhancing uh, my tool set as we move from project to project to project to project. Um, so I created a plugin. <clears throat> but uh, first, let me sort of describe my personal philosophy about um, ambient sound design. So um, I like to think of Bob Ross the legend, um, and how he composes uh, a painting. If anyone is unfamiliar with Bob Ross, then you've got a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> please watch some. I recommend it. But you'll note that um, he always starts with a, a distant sort of background. He'll, he'll first layer in sort of the sky coloring and then it'll build out uh, some background mountains or something like that. A lot of, the, a lot of his paintings are very similar. Uh, and then uh, start fleshing in a mid-ground area. And then, of course, the infamous happy trees tend to be near the front, right? And so I like to think of building out a soundscape with that metaphor. And if you go into the tool, you'll notice that there is kind of a landscape painting metaphor with the way that I've described my assets. So, um, <clears throat> so for background, I like to think about first the, the air and building up uh, some sort of air element. And that is kind of like my noise floor. 
I want that to be the quietest element in my uh, experience. Now, um, working in Unreal, something that you'll want to think about is uh, for legacy reasons, this will not always be the case, but for now, this is the case. When you import audio, it's converted, it's converted into 16-bit fixed PCM data and stored as uncompressed data. And then also a cooked version, which uses whatever codec you've selected, is also stored there. Now, the mixing environment, when it's actually rendering in real time, um, is 32-bit float. So this is a comparison of the dynamic range of a 16-bit fixed uh, audio file and the, we'll call it the potential <laughs> dynamic range of 32-bit float, which has uh, an insane dynamic range, um, an impossible dynamic range. Uh, so there's lots of room when you're rendering uh, your, your, uh, your audio. So I try to be very strict right up front with the dynamic range of the assets I import into Unreal. I want to take advantage of as much of this 96 dB as possible. And um, I usually err on the hotter side, uh, I, just a little bit. Um, we want to preserve this, but it's, uh, it's much easier, in my opinion, to mix subtractively to reduce the gain than to boost the gain. So um, I try to think about this up front, especially as I start to build up my noise floor. Another thing to sort of keep in mind, um, and this is going to be something that varies from project to project, but it is worth thinking about synthesis when you're talking about room tone, which is really just shaped noise, right? And so um, part of the advantage of synthesizing noise and then maybe filtering it or EQing it is that it is rendering in that 32-bit audio environment. And uh, noise is actually one of those finicky things that does a very terrible job of compressing. Uh, and you'll find a lot of artifacts sometimes when you compress noise. And also, there's a very little, uh, very small memory hit when you're synthesizing uh, noise versus. So that's something to explore since it's possible. Um, in the city sample, you'll notice that I actually use a combination of the two. Um, I've, I've found um, <clears throat> having a, a sort of more realistic city bed with identifiable noises in it um, combined with some shaped synthesized noise was effective. Um, this is another thing to think about early on is to calibrate expectations when you're starting to build up from the ground floor. I like to build up from that ground floor. Um, but sometimes when I start early on in the project, when I start building up from that ground floor, designers and um, artists will sort of crank the audio until it's like at this comfortable range and they'll be like, wow, your wind is really loud. And it's like, no, that's not wind. That's like shh, it's supposed to be like the quietest sound you can imagine. So you want to kind of cal calibrate for reviews uh, whenever possible, um, just sort of set expectations. One, th one thing that I always think of is, you know, in, in those horror games when you're, when you're doing the gamma calibration, like here's the block that you could just barely see and here's right, then, and you always tweak it really high because you don't want to be scared that much, <laughs> right? We need something like that for audio, where it's just like, OK, let's calibrate this. This sound is supposed to be the quietest sound you want to hear. Uh, and this is the loudest one that you want to hear. So that's something I, I think is, is useful early on. As for the, my approach to uh, the middle ground, um, I like to uh, think about mid ground in terms of 3D sounds scattered around the player. And what's important, and I'll, I'll kind of cover that, I'll re refer to this again, is that these are 
trivial sounds in terms of the Golden Path gameplay experience, but they're important for the world building experience. Right? And the reason I like this sort of scattering approach, where it's actually placing sounds in 3D space, is because as you rotate the camera around, you will hear them in position in the world, giving the world a little bit more of that static realism. But also, as you move through, translate through the world, you'll actually pass through them, and it'll give the world depth. So that's kind of my, my philosophy on that. And then I will sort of enhance those by trying to build them up from my noise floor. Um, so, for example, if I have a sort of air tone, like an outdoor air tone, I might try to have wind that sort of swells up from that. I don't want to have wind that sort of pops out in the middle of that uh, sort of, sort of uh, dynamic experience. I want it to sort of swell up from it so it feels like it's still part of that continuous world experience. I, you'll see in, in a lot of the projects that, I, that go out to samples, I use natural attenuation uh, fall off a lot for my ambient sounds. The exception being that these are sounds that hopefully won't be too close to the listener because the natural uh, shape ramps up real high right next to the source. So um, I tend to start here and uh, see if that works in sort of the, because I'm just trying to get that middle ground. Um, I will I'll use uh, air absorption all the time. And uh, part of the reason is because uh, the sort of natural world elements, as you, as you pass through them, as you pass by them, you'll hear the, the uh, high frequency information sort of fall off, and it'll become in increasingly less distinct. And other more golden path sounds, those transients will, will pop a little bit better in the mix and be more noticeable. Um, and then part of that is also if you have a sort of smaller sound, you'll see that I will oftentimes also include a, um, a high pass filter to sort of simulate the diffusion of low frequency information in the world space. But you'll see that I won't use that on like large elements uh, or, or something that um, needs to retain that base information. And then I will also take advantage of diffusion over distance. You can see here we have the attenuation reverb settings. <laughs> um, but uh, in my projects, you'll notice a lot that I uh, like to use convolution, convolution reverb. Uh, especially if you get a really nice outdoor uh, impulse, it can help sell that sense of diffusion as the sound source gets farther and farther away from the listener. And you'll notice um, in a lot of those, I'll be taking advantage of a send level that increases as it gets farther away. So it sort of uh, enhances that sense of smearing and diffusion in space. <clears throat> okay, so in the city sample, what I start the first thing I start started out with was some continuous air beds. Just like I mentioned, I want to get that background in there. I want to have no dig. I, basically, I'm looking for getting rid of digital silence in the experience, and so. Um, <clears throat> I should have, should work now, hopefully. We have volume, amazing. So if I, uh, solo all the sounds that have air in the name. 
you can kind of hear that that bed and if you pay close attention you can hear some filtered noise as a sort of base layer of of audio and uh <clears throat> There might be some lingering air uh, playing. Part of the uh, bed, the static bed, um, and if you have, by the way, ambisonics as your static bed, I think that's great. This sort of air tone for ambisonics. I didn't have, I didn't have that, unfortunately, uh, in, in this project, but if you have something like source like that, um, it can be really nice to, because we, we support world lock ambisonics so as you move around the world rotating you'll feel the world sort of you will feel like you're actually rotating through a world rather than hearing the same thing in the uh, left and right channels but um, part of this uh, the composition of this particular meta sound is uh, I have something like five or six um, air loops that I randomize and crossfade between every 10 seconds or something like that as the sort of city detail information and then I have a sort of continuous um, I don't remember if I modulate it much uh, at all um, uh, shaped noise filtered and EQ noise and then the um, And then the, uh, the uh, last thing that I added was um, some static beds for moving quickly and for high altitude. So I wanted uh, a gradual increase in sort of a cold air tone as you go up in the sky. And also as you move quickly some slight wind. So this is this to me is the um, should be the lowest set sound in the experience. So if we were doing that calibration, that'd be like you can just barely hear this. Of course, the music comes in right when I'm talking about this. Uh, music also, by the way, could be this experience for you. You know, if you're working on a uh, a game that maybe is more user interfacey than um, world like, uh, th the music actually takes the place of this sort of a, this background experience. All right, dramatic music. Okay. Oops. Did it return? Did it come back? No, of course not. Okay, so another challenge that I ran into with the city sample and the Matrix Awakens uh, sandbox environment was that um, there were 17,000 NPC vehicles. And uh, part of the challenge there was that you could get close to a vehicle and you could fly away from the vehicle and still see it very, very far away. And then you followed around the city and then you could fly back to it. And so <clears throat> as you do, uh, trying to create variations, I had 12 or so makes and models of vehicles and attempted to create some sort of system to vary the each instance of that sound. However, I needed to make, I need to ensure that if the sound source of the car went out of range and then came back in range, which would mean a new instance of the sound, that it sounded the same. So thankfully, the uh, architects of Metasounds thought ahead 
And part of the pillars of MetaSounds is that almost every time, if not every time, there's a random function, there's also an option for a seed input. So a seeded random uh, function is um, a way to get a fake random experience where it's actually deterministic. And so you can know in, um, so that every time you run that random function, it will actually uh, repeat those initial values. And that was, um, that was a nice way to sort of start there. And when I worked with the AI team, this is really important, um, they were able to give me uh, the ID of each AI agent, so all 17,000 of them. And so whenever they came in to my, my range, I was able to use that ID as the seed, as the unique seed for that car. And that resulted in sort of 17,000 variations, <laughs> which is awesome. This is what we're looking for. So let me see if I can actually show you that. I would like to. This is a much nicer picture. This is what I want all of them to look like. Okay. Might have been a mistake to stop that. So for example, this is not commented well, but um, <clears throat> go you can see everything okay so you'll see there's a seed input all of this all these inputs can be fed in from gameplay um, which means that I can swap out things like the um, the uh, sounds uh, oh this is this is a little bug hold on a second there's a little bug there there we go um, <clears throat> we can swap out the sounds wave files uh, in this, in this uh, case, there are three uh, wave uh, players where I crossfade between them. Crossfade. Um, and uh, those are just simple loops, idle, low engine, high engine. Um, this we, for the uh, drivable vehicle, we went with a granular approach, which is sort of the more modern way of doing cars these days. But because I wanted so many NPC vehicles at once, I think I... I, think I Sonify maybe 30 at once at any given time. Um, I wanted a sort of simpler approach, also because they're NPC vehicles. They're not that important, right? Um, so, uh, and in my observations, a lot of sort of modern cars kind of just sound like they're very boring. And so, um, this approach was more economical, and I was able to run more um, and then I also have some noise generation and some uh, a sort of sub layer and so um, if the seed input is negative one then every time I play this let me give the um, let me set the velocity up to uh, some oops some reasonable value So every time I play this, oh, I forgot to turn this down. There we go. Cross your fingers. Every time I play, it'll be a new, new, new pitch thresholds, new balances between the set, the, the engine tone, the noise, and the sub sounds. However, so this is all the sedan model, make and model. However, if I give it some specific value, which maybe that's, there we go. Give it some specific value, then every time I play, it'll be the same. So this seed input uh, is the actual ID of that AI agent. And so that's how um, I was able to gives 17,000 variations. <laughs>
Um, ah, here we are. Oh, and of course, let's do this like we had it before. And then it doesn't resume, so I have to do this and this. And we're back. Oh, so yeah. Um, so I worked with the AI uh, team to create a pipe query. If you look in the world, if you want to have your programmer look in there, or if you're a coder, um, the world audio data module, uh, the plugin in the city sample will have this query, and you can actually look at it and see what's in it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they sort of set up the pipe query skeleton for me, and I was able to customize it uh, for my needs um, and uh, get um, all of the cars by significance and distance. Sig AI significance is within the view frustum and distance from the player. So I get 30 and 30, and then I just get rid of the dupes. Um, and uh, part of the challenge here uh, was that the AI was actually only turning the uh, closest 10 vehicles into like real actors and the rest of them are just floating nanite meshes with some fancy shaders for the tires. So um, <laughs> uh, I actually have a system that places audio components inside those floating vehicles to sort of simulate that uh, the sound coming from those vehicles. So that's where the subsystem control comes from. Uh, so I just have a subsystem sort of handling that. Um, and I um, use AI to track the position of uh, the vehicle in the world space. Uh, so I ended up not actually interacting with the nanomeshes themselves. So yeah, uh, this is something that I definitely recommend checking out. Uh, as a... Uh, as I see it, procedural worlds are going to be more and more common in our developer space and handling unique entities and procedurally built entities is going to be something that we'll need to deal with as sound designers. Um, yeah, so the actual Soundscape plugin sort of has a genesis um, that uh, coincides with my fascination and interest in ambient sound design. So if you look at this, the old legacy spatial audio temple, you'll see sort of a progenitor of the soundscape system where I have individual actors built with blueprints controlling the various uh, ambient sound elements, birds, uh, shoreline sounds, wind, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I actually gave a talk in 2019 where I talk about uh, converting that into a more data-driven approach. And then when uh, we started working on the UE5 announcement project, Lumen in the Land of Nanite, it's a mouthful, um, I decided that I didn't want to keep building these up myself. I wanted to make a plugin that I could carry with me from project to project. Um, my own little tool that worked the way I expected it to work. Um, however, I was working with an audio director who had some requests of his own. But generally, I wanted to get rid of the idea of using actors, um, relying on an actor per sound source, um, and instead just sort of spawning sounds around the player as it was appropriate. Um, and uh, there were some unclear boundaries in terms of what Soundscape should have been responsible for versus um, what the audio director at the time wanted Soundscape to, to do. Um, so when we worked on the early access project, Valley of the Ancient, uh, that audio director left the company and I could do whatever I wanted. And so I overhauled the system that we had before. Uh, there were a lot of lessons learned um, that I wanted to sort of clean up. Uh, one of them was making it safe to uh, sort of edit your properties while you're uh, playing in the editor, that sort of stuff. And then also to basically set up a contract where um, Soundscape is really just about those trivial world elements and it's not about golden path sound elements. Um, 
that should be handled more specifically and more with more care. Um, and then also, the previous version had a lot of capabilities like concatenation and randomization and stuff like that. And as we were building um, out MetaSounds, we realized that uh, MetaSounds is actually a much more elegant way to handle those sorts of uh, scenarios. So, you know, with MetaSounds as sort of like a, a beefy sound of design environment, I could simplify a lot of things in, in terms of how Soundscape worked. Uh, so that brings us to the city sample, which uh, I had to work on immediately after uh, Valley of the Ancient. Um, literally, it was just like, okay, where did that weird? So um, part of the challenge with the city sample and the Matrix Awakens uh, sandbox environment was that I asked the 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 uh, the team, you know, how is how is the world placed? They they're basically generating the entire city in Houdini, an external tool for procedural generation. And I asked them, when are you going to lock down the city? And they said, no. They're not they're not going to lock down the city. They in fact are going to regenerate the city up to twice a week for the entire development cycle. So even up till literally right before we shipped, they were uh, updating the city. So I did not have, I could not rely on any sort of hand-placed elements in this process. And I realized, OK, I'm going to have to use Soundscape a lot, and I'm going to have to figure out other solutions. So <clears throat> one of the problems uh, with Soundscape at the time was that uh, it didn't have any sort of sense of the world. You would just set the state based on, uh, you know, in the case of Valley of the Ancient, you're in the desert or you're in the dark world, and then this is the sound environment that you're experiencing. Um, and so uh, I needed a way to deal with um, the world space and have soundscape spawn sounds in a way that is contextually appropriate to what's in the world. So the first thing that I implemented, because it was just on my bucket list uh, after, after Valley of the Ancient, was uh, conditional spawning, where I spawn based on an async trace that you add. And if it hits a surface, then it spawns against that surface. It moves it, it, moves it to that surface. Uh, because I wanted, in Valley of the Ancient, I wanted to be able to have uh, uh, the sort of natural hilly environment and sounds to spawn against the rocks and stuff like that. And I just didn't have time to work on that. So it was in my mind coming into this, OK, I need conditional spawning as a concept. And this is the first implementation. And the next implementation that I realized I needed was some way to um, spawn based off of metadata, some sort of contextual metadata. And so the, uh, the original idea, uh, and I haven't really expressed this yet, as I mentioned before, I had this sort of lands landscape painting metaphor going on. So the, the asset type that uh, controls spawning behavior for a sound, I call it a soundscape color. Um, and uh, the sort of state activation um, I called a soundscape palette, which is a collection of colors. Like, it makes sense, right? So I wanted to call this the soundscape pigment system, sort of express density of color and where color would be appropriate. And uh, Aaron said that was too many metaphors deep. <laughs> and so he allowed me to call it the color point system. Uh, because really what it is is it's a sort of metadata scoring method. And I had already exper experimented on other systems that I developed for Valley of the Ancient with this concept called spatial hashing. And I have an example here to sort of expl explain what spatial hashing is. If you can imagine, you have uh, maybe like a checkerboard or something like that, and you throw some beans on the checkerboard. Well, <clears throat> the coordinates for, like, say, this star here uh, might be like 
1.6 or something, and maybe 1.2, that direction, right? And so that uh, data is very descriptive of that location. But I only needed the general information, like, is there a star in the general vicinity of where I would want to play a sound? Um, and so spatial hashing allows me to collapse, essentially collapse multidimensional space into one dimension. Ooh, it's a magic trick. And so <laughs> it's actually very simple. Uh, what, what you would do is, is with some multiplication and some addition, you could turn those coordinates into a single value where, and this is, uh, you've all done this before, whenever you did um, decimal placement math, you could actually think of base 10 as the same problem. Imagine the first place in your number series um, is the x coordinate and the next place is the y coordinate. Then you go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 3, one, right? Counting all the way up. So it's the same idea. What we're collapsing is um, this value and this value into a single series of numbers. And then I can store that information in a sparse map where, oh, in box 5, there is one star. In box 6, there is one star. In box 10, there are two stars. And in box 12, there is one star. And so if I want to spawn some sparkly sound, um, I can say, OK, I want to spawn here. Soundscape will be like, I want to spawn here in this coordinate. And it'll just run that little function, the hashing function, which is pretty cheap. And it'll say, oh, this is box 5. Well, I can only um, play this sparkle sound if there's at least one star score in my space. Turns out box 5, yes, it will play the sound. But if it tried to play it in box 4, it would say, oh, no, I'm not going to play a sound there. So that's how I decided to approach this problem. And I asked the Houdini people, OK, can you give me my own database of information and metadata, point cloud was what they call it, of the city. And I was like, I need to know, and they're like, what do you need to know? I'm like, I need to know if there's a sidewalk there. I need to know if there's a road. I need to know if it's a highway. I need to know if it's a building, if it's a park, if there's water, if it's the, the boundary of the city, if there's a pier. And so they gave me this. This is a visualization of that point cloud. And it's kind of hard to tell, but there are dots, which represent a single point of metadata. It's total 1.4 million points of data. It's a very large city, right? 16 square kilometers. So um, <clears throat> that's a lot. That's a lot of information. So I was concerned about memory. <laughs> I don't know. How am I going to store all this information in my subsystem? Uh, they're going to come after me. The, the, memory, the memory police are going to come after me, right? Uh, so um, we have this cool module in the city sample, which you should totally check out if you're interested in procedural design, called the rule processor. And I hope someday it becomes a real engine feature because it's, in my opinion, one of the coolest things happening outside of audio in Unreal. Um, and the way that the rule processor works is it allows you to sort of interpret that Houdini data. At least that's how it works in the city sample. I think they have larger, grander vision for what it could be as an engine feature. Um, but uh, what I was able to do, I essentially realized I needed to only load the information that was near the player. I knew that much. And I knew that I did not know how to write my own streaming manager. So I cheated, and I used world partition. And so 
World Partition, if you don't know, is this um, system for large uh, world spaces where uh, as the player moves through space, these grids of actors load up and it's only the grids of actors that you, that you need that are the closest to you, that are most relevant to you, that load up. And as you leave spaces, those grids unload. And so um, <clears throat> what I did is I worked with the rule processor team to create my own rule where uh, I sliced up the city into 30 by 30 squares. And for each square, I just took that little geographical chunk of data. I uh, hashed it in, as the spatial hash. Um, and I cached it, that rhymes, cached it on an actor that I put in the center of that grid spot. And that actor would load in and out as World Partition loaded all the actors in the area in and out. And so I didn't end up having to actually write a streaming manager, and I was happy. So, um, so that was a pretty big win. And actually, um, if we, I have to, if we quickly look at the city sample outliner, you can actually see these actors. These are all the actors that cache that information. And um, <clears throat> I have some editor-only information that actually shows me uh, what, uh, what data is actually cached on it. So I use this as part of the debug as I was building things out. Uh, what I think one of the cool things about um, building out coding and uh, building out in, in uh, code your custom actors is that you can designate specific information or specific parts of the actor that only exist in the editor and uh, other parts that uh, exist either in the editor or in the game environment. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, if I were to uh, play this again, we would probably only see maybe um, a dozen, maybe 20 loaded at any given time. And uh, each one just has this small little hash map that it gives to my subsystem as it uh, loads in. And then as it goes away, it says, hey, you can get rid of that. And of course, you can look at my World Audio Data module um, if you want to like learn more about the the code that drives that. Okay. All right. So this solved a lot of problems. I was able to spawn around the world contextual information. So like I was able to spawn traffic, like a small traffic sound, like maybe a car pass by, only on a road. So it doesn't spawn in a building or in a park or whatever. Um, and if there was some large information, like, like medium traffic sounds, then I would spawn that only in spaces where uh, there were high road counts. And um, part of my system uses, there's a little bit of an LOD thing where I have different si uh, resolution uh, spatial hash maps um, that sort of represent um, smaller or larger regions of space. And I pick different ones based on how far away I'm trying to spawn a sound. Those are all settable in uh, settings. Um, but one of the issues that's sort of a classic game audio problem that is just frustrating and always present is this is the old classic river problem where you have a continuous sound that you want to represent um, and it's it needs to move with you as you go around and the, needs to follow the river or whatever in my case my rivers were the highways and the boundary of the map now the old method of solving this is to use a uh, spline actor or something like that and have the uh, audio component uh, responsible sort of follow along that spline actor. But the problem that I had was the size of the city. I, c I did not feel like I could have one actor responsible for all of this data. 
and to have to load that up all the time. And so I made a concession in terms of my memory responsibility. I try to be a good citizen with memory, but the concession I made was that in the case of boundaries and highways, um, I also stored the vector, the original vector data. And they never came after me. So the reason was I could still use my little cache actors. And in this case, they would load up that, um, that discrete vector data information as well as the hash map. And it would only be if I was near that sound. And so I have a sort of continuous highway sound that uh, helps smooth out the, the gaps between my various spawned highway, you know, drive-by sounds. And uh, likewise, I have sort of a, an air sound around the boundary of the city to help sell the idea that there's a <clears throat> wide open space. I like that sort of open air sound. Um, and that way, one actor wasn't responsible for a whole circumference of the city. And I only load th those vectors in when I'm near them. So that was, yeah, I did a small memory hit, um, but they never, they never noticed. So I was sneaky about it, I guess. And um, the source data is distributed across multiple world partitions, so I don't have to worry about one actor uh, owning everything. However, I'd like to explore alternative approaches for this. This is something that I didn't implement in Soundscape because I didn't feel like it was elegant enough a sol solution. And I'd still like to figure that, solve that problem out. Rivers. So once these, the, the uh, city started coming together, the art director, Jerome, um, said that uh, ev everyone was very polite. It was a very polite city. It was, <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, <laughs> Thankfully, uh, there were some easy uh, tunables. I could just sort of increase the frequency of honking horns. Um, but one of the things that, I ha that, uh, that we sort of agreed on that we needed something where like people were yelling. But I didn't want shouts uh, as just like the, the uh, I didn't want traffic noise in the middle of a building. I didn't want shouts coming from empty spaces around the player. So we w I went back to the AI team and I was like, Let's get metahumans. Let's see how many metahumans we can get. And so I was actually able to add to my existing pipe query an amortized query, which is to say it, um, it doesn't query every tick. It just queries, say, like four or five times a second, which is pretty frequent, but not all the time. And um, I was able to get the closest 150 metahumans as just a, a list of metahuman uh, locations, and I was able to get uh, the closest, um, well, I was already grabbing the closest cars already, so all I did was dis, uh, just give me the standing ones, the ones that are not moving. Um, similarly, I only want the metahumans that are not moving, because if Soundscape's going to spawn a sound, and I'm only doing it uh, four or five times a second, I can't have them driving off and then the sound like happening after they've left the spot. So. You'll notice that, and this makes sense. Thank you. We're running out of time, um, but I'm the last one. Um, so you'll notice that's only stopped vehicles honk excessively, but that makes sense, right? And uh, stopped metahumans will do their shouts, so Soundscape's actually handling all of the shouts like, Oi, Tina, or whatever they say. Um, and uh, yeah, so there we go. Oh, and the, if you get close to a group of them, you can kind of hear them mumble to each other, some sort of small conversation. But I tried to mix it real low because uh, sometimes it didn't. The, the voice actors didn't always match the metahuman sort of characters in the space, so it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a fudge there. Um, one of the challenges I ran into was fast movement. They wanted to move as fast as possible. I wanted to sort of constrain movement because I was like, oh, Soundscape's actually not keeping up with, you're actually like the spawning sounds behind you now. Um, so I tried to uh, lean forward with my spawn angles, so sort of 
favors uh, spawning in front of the player. I got I started calling rain, uh, sounds that are out of range so that um, if they're way behind you, then uh, they no longer count toward the sort of density settings that you set. Um, and then for fun, you, you add Doppler, right? That's what you do. So I add two different kinds of Doppler, pitch-based for the NPC vehicles because um, it's a cheap and easy calculation. And I was also having issues where moving fast, uh, the AI system was sort of slow to register the significance of the vehicles. And so um, sometimes... <laughs> It wouldn't become a real vehicle until like you were almost past it. So I needed that Doppler to, to be very instantaneous. But then uh, for the honks, I used uh, delay-based Doppler. I didn't do a Doppler on the metahuman shouts because I thought it would sound too goofy. Like, hey, do you know? Something like that. So I was running out of time, just like I'm running out of time here. And so I was like, oh, I forgot about reverb. We actually had a sort of, we asked the Houdini people, like, hey, because I didn't know how I was going to solve this problem. Um, I was like, hey, can you, maybe you can give us this, like, you can, like, do, uh, as you're sampling, maybe give us a sphere and, like, how open that sphere gets at any given point. And so we had this idea of openness. But it's, it's not very good because, you know, you could be, like, between two buildings and it's not very open, but then there's, like, a tall space above you or in front of you or behind you. Um, and uh, the part of the problem was that it encoded the point cloud as a vector for the spot and a string for the value. And so because they normalized the values, the openness values, a lot of the values I got were just zero because the float got cut off. Um, so And we didn't have time to reiterate. So I very quickly just sort of implemented a a simple threshold where it's like when you're near a highway you get sort of a highway reverb if you're above the highway it just sort of kicks it back to the normal reverb and then hopefully if you get away from the highway uh, you get the normal reverb again uh, so that's kind of how I fudge that um, but I would like to explore more ways or approaches to sort of dealing with procedurally developed environments and and reverb and uh, and then of course um, there was this sort of experience as I was building out the reverb where I was under the highway and a bus or a big rig went over and it was like distorted in the low end. And I was like, wow, that's cool. My ears tingled and I was like, yeah, that's cool. And so I was like, uh, should I get rid of that? Should I filter that out? I don't know. So I shipped it. They QA kicked it back and I was like, let's try it anyway. And uh, if you watch plays like Let's Plays, it's one of the things that people like about the, the audio so but then when we did the city sample I, I revisited it and I took it out um, because there were times in the city sample where it would just be like four big rigs and it's just like it sounds bad so all right as uh, oh, with all projects there are surprises yay they added docs at the last minute <laughs> I thankfully was lurking in an art meeting and I was like oh okay we're gonna have to deal with that um, they added a night mode. <laughs> so I just very quickly uh, implemented a, 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 sound, a soundscape palette for night mode that just adds a bunch of sirens. <laughs> take, take that as you will. <laughs> and, uh, and Zach was able to do like a club remix of the like ambient uh, music. Um, uh, and this is something, this is actually a call out to the game designers out there. Please uh, use explicit state with something like night mode. They had implied state where they were doing like a flip-flop and they were like, and so I had a difficulty doing a good implementation of that um, because I had to imply it myself as well. Um, they expanded the exploration zone. I, initially, I thought it was just going to be the boundary of the city and then you were going to go over the water, but then they were like, hey, you can go as far as you want. Um, so there's parts where you're like, the water just doesn't sound like water anymore. Um, and then they added user settable object density so that you could scale how many metahumans or how many NPC cars. Thankfully, the metahumans, because I was just querying the metahumans and using that as my soundscape data, it just scaled naturally. But the NPC cars, I didn't have a scaling mechanism built in for the ambient traffic noise, so it just turns off at the very zero. <laughs> at zero. <laughs> So real quick, some lessons learned. 
I actually honestly believe that procedural world generation is the future of game audio. I think that we're going to see, or future of game development in general. I think we're going to see a lot more procedurally generated worlds and sort of handcrafted golden paths um, so that we can get these, give p people these sort of large sandbox experiences. And as sound designers, we're going to really need to figure out how to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> metadata is just going to be the thing that we have to deal with a lot of, I imagine. We have to figure out how we can get that metadata, how we can use that, how we can um, exploit it, and how we handle static environments and dynamic environments. Um, seated modulation and anything you just, that was, I felt, was, was a good win, especially for meta sounds. Um, that I was able to do that was really just wonderful. And uh, yeah, we need to sort of figure out ways to, to better uh, support procedural design approaches um, and pipelines at large. So I hope, to, like Rule Processor, I hope to see that build out as an engine feature, a larger engine feature. And streaming in open worlds is just, it's the future, right? So some quick uh, roadmap things I'd like to be able to do. I said uh, that you could update uh, soundscape colors in during Pi, but I'd also be able to like to update palettes. I'd be able to like I'd like to be able to simulate a palette without even playing, which would be cool. Some things that I end up using attaching to listener. Um, these are things that I implemented sort of um, sort of scrappily on this project, um, but I'd like to make that a sort of first class version. All of this stuff I'd like to make sort of first class. Explore editor modes, maybe ways to convert foliage instant static um, instant static meshes into like color point data. That I think would be really cool. Um, I'd like to integrate with volumes. Maybe the audio gameplay volumes is a venue for that. Thank you, I see that. We're out of time, by the way. Uh, continuously moving uh, sources, handling that, like I mentioned, that sort of stream, the river bed scenario. Um, and then maybe some sort of debug, right? Because we want to be able to solve solve the problems we run into or create. Any questions? Thank you.